Welcome to Health and Our Built Environment After COVID, a South by Southwest panel presented by Michigan House. The reverberations of the COVID crisis will be wide ranging from the ways we socialize and work to the very buildings and cities we live in. This panel examines the way experts in a variety of fields from city government to private enterprise are thinking about health and the environment we build. It'll explore the lessons learned, theories challenged, and the collaborative path towards a healthier relationship between humans and the places they live. To start, why don't we have our panelists introduce themselves? Sure. My name is Emily Anthes, and I'm a science journalist and author. And my most recent book, which came out in June of 2020, is called The Great Indoors, The Surprising Science of How Buildings Shape Our Behavior, Health, and Happiness. Hello, I'm Kofi Bonner, and I'm the CEO of Bedrock. And Bedrock is in Detroit, and uh, we are a commercial real estate developer, and we operate about 18 million square feet in assets, both in Detroit downtown and in Cleveland. Hello, everyone. My name is Mark Washington. I'm city manager for the city of Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I've been here about uh, three years now. And then prior to that, I spent uh, time in Austin, Texas, as well as uh, Fort Worth, Texas. Um, hello, my name is Marcus Shipley, and I am the Chief Innovation and Information Officer for Trinity Health. Um, I come to uh, the provider side of healthcare after a career in financial services and insurance, and work along my, my side my colleagues every day, supporting our innovation, digital health, and information services functions. Um, Trinity Health um, serves communities in 22 states, and we are one of the largest healthcare systems in the country, uh, roughly $19 billion in revenue, we do over a billion dollars of community benefit every year um, with 125,000 or so colleagues that are serving um, communities that include um, hospitals, clinically integrated networks, uh, programs for all inclusive care of the elderly um, and 100 continuing care locations. And um, Ted, I'd like to, uh, before we jump into the panel and uh, invite my other panelists to join me in, in saying thank you to all of our, our caregivers all of our frontline workers who have so bravely fought this pandemic for the past year and uh, wish them all well. Thanks so much to all of you for being here. To start, Emily, why don't you tell us about the central thesis behind your book and the ways in which design and our built environment really affect our health and wellness? Absolutely. So the central premise of the book is that our indoor environments shape our lives in profound and, and sometimes surprising ways and that they shape nearly every aspect of our lives. So that includes physical health, mental health, uh, cognitive and workplace performance. They shape our social networks and affect our relationships with other people. And they have all of these influences that we don't typically appreciate. Um, so the book is full of examples, uh, but to give just two, so there's a well-known study from the 80s that shows that the view that patients have out a hospital window can actually affect how quickly they recover from surgery and how much pain they're in and how much painkiller they use. Um, maybe at the other end of the spectrum, something that's a bit more cognitive, uh, there's also research that shows that the temperature of our workplaces and our offices, so that's the air temperature, affects our cognitive performance and how well we perform workplace tasks. So that's just two of many examples of, of how the indoor environment affects us. Thanks, Emily. Kofi, how about Bedrock? Has the last year changed the way Bedrock thinks about the projects they are building? Are there any specific projects that have changed because of what we've all learned? Well, sure. Uh, you know, this last year, as Emily has pointed out, uh, and you have just said, has been extremely difficult for those of us in the real estate industry, primarily because of the tenants we have, both in the office space and the retail space. Uh, obviously, health comes first to any landlord and any uh, business, and the health of their employees and the health of their uh, clients is extremely important. And at, with the pandemic and kindly also the social disruption in the country, uh, we have had to really think through how we as landlords and frankly developers think about how not only how we uh, deal with the existing spaces we have but how we might change the way we build in the urban environment to perhaps uh, uh, mitigate some of the issues that we have seen so more specifically certainly in the interior spaces 
obviously when everybody had to leave, we had to take a look at air filtration systems. We had to certainly look at how closely people were sitting together and really think about redesigning those spaces for the eventuality when people come back. And I will tell you that's an evolution as we begin to understand more and more of what makes sense. We're beginning to organize ourselves for more of a hybrid uh, a situation where some people will continue to work from home perhaps a lot more than others and those who do come may only be here two to three days a week and so they be shared workspace concepts so we have to really think about when people come to the office how can they feel really comfortable so that they want to come to the office and feel safe in doing so because obviously that affects productivity to uh, Emily's earlier point so we're really thinking through all those. Uh, we are fortunate enough to have a really high level interior designer that's really thinking about data as they're planning uh, these interior spaces with us called Pop House. And it's part of our family of companies. They're doing an excellent job really creating mock-ups for us to all really experience these new spaces. Uh, so we're, we're really going through uh, a significant uh, amount of redesign on the, in the interior of the office spaces. With respect to our tenancies in the retail, obviously the small businesses, as you know, are the backbone of this country and they hire so many local folks and they've just been devastated, totally punished by uh, the last year. And so we as landlords have tried to really find ways to bring people, new customers downtown in a very safe manner. They can mask up and come downtown with their friends and family and uh, we have tried to create outdoor spaces and expand the, frankly, the reach of the restaurants into those outdoor spaces, but created in a memorable way. Created a whole campaign called Decked Out Detroit, which is actually pretty fun uh, 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 concept. And we just really just built out a bunch of outdoor spaces and uh, worked with our tenants to uh, really get them feeling safe and the restaurants feeling safe to operate out there and frankly make it more inviting for folks to come downtown. And, and we also created some really interesting events, events that people would come downtown and create memorable experiences. We even took one of our uh, outdoor uh, lots that was frankly vacant and we transformed it into a, a drive-in. A drive-in so people could load up their kids, come downtown, sit in their cars, and watch a family-friendly movie, uh, you know, sometimes in the snow. So it, it, we, we've done a lot of things, both from the physical space and, frankly, from the outdoor spaces to try to just make our space, our, our environment where we are working and operating a lot more inviting to people so that our customers would feel more safe and our businesses perhaps could just gain a little more revenues than they would otherwise if they just shut down totally. Marcus, as a health system, how do you all think about design and wellness? Has the past year changed or reinforced any philosophies? Has it fostered any innovation? Certainly. So I think um, it, it has reinforced a few things. So um, starting from the outside and then maybe working my way in, um, as a, um, as a tax-exempt health system, we're required to conduct something that's called a community health needs assessment, CHNAs. Um, and as part of those community health needs assessments, um, one of the things we look at are uh, social determinants. We like to prefer to, we prefer to call them social influences of health. Um, and one of those influencers is the neighborhood and built environment, which includes access to healthy foods, quality of housing, uh, crime, violence, and environmental conditions. So the built environment is something that we assess as part of these CHNAs um, within each of our regions that we serve, all of the communities that we serve, um, and finding out that the interplay between the built environment and healthcare um, is actually very important. So, um, and, as we, and as we look at the inside environment, so um, Emily referenced Roger Ulrich's work where he showed that a view of garden or nature helped um, really improve the recovery rates for patients, um, fewer pain medications and so forth. And in many of our, our hospitals across the country, we have healing gardens that are used for both patients, family members, uh, sometimes the communities are able to enjoy them. Um, and we've brought these healing gardens into many of our hospitals and medical centers. So the, the, the way we think about the space um, is um, more than, it's more than utilitarian. We're actually looking at the space from an overall health and well-being point of view. Um, so um, I think that will, that's been reinforced. Some changes that have occurred and things that we're looking at is the elimination of the waiting room. Um, so one of the things that we've uh, come to appreciate as part of this pandemic is 
um, you don't want to wait in line. You certainly don't want to be around a bunch of people. Um, and the elimination of the waiting room and pulling in the technologies that allow for more virtual queuing and notification of patients is helping people feel safer about coming to the healthcare environment. And do you think that's a, that's a change that'll stick around? I do. I do. Um, I think a couple of things um, happened over the course of the pandemic. Um, first, far too many people did not get the care that they needed to get um, as they were um, afraid to come to facilities, uh, hunker down with family. Um, the, the, the maintenance care just went by the wayside. And there were far too many people that, that perished as a result of that. Um, some good things that we saw, though, is, is people started getting more care in the home, so more virtual care. Um, more in-home home visits. And so we launched several programs that are allowing us to expand those capabilities. And uh, I do expect that they'll stick around for a while. Uh, Mark, from a city planning side, what has the last year taught you about the physical spaces we live in? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's caused us to really rethink how we both behave as an employer as well as how we uh, create community. So as an employer, all of those challenges around uh, looking at office spaces and utilization and making sure that people are um, safe and and have the appropriate mitigating personal protective equipment and uh, those are similar issues that m many employers and businesses are, are dealing with but as a convener of people in the public spaces we had to really really rethink even park usage for example uh, and events out in parks and having zones within zones that will allow individual families and couples to safely gather in bubbles uh, with other people. Or the most transformative uh, things that we've done is really allowed some of the uh, small businesses and restaurants uh, to take advantage of what would normally have been public space or public right-of-way and allow that to be an extension of their businesses, whether it's sidewalks or street closures that allow us to create outdoor dining that would allow them to have more capacity to serve uh, their uh, customers and create it and do it in a safer environment because we know with COVID-19 uh, having experiences outdoor is uh, has proven to be much safer than being in confined environments. And so it's caused us to really think about uh, how we utilize public spaces, everything from outdoor class spaces for schools. We've done uh, several, have several projects in, in, in place now where we're doing uh, transforming outdoor uh, park experiences to be more utilized for, for students and having them integrate with nature more to even having uh, outdoor concerts uh, that with in, in non-traditional venues that are not amphitheaters. One of the things we did this summer to promote more activation was to take one of our bridges that we have uh, in Grand Rapids that crosses the Grand River and that became the venue for an outdoor opera, which we had, by the way, uh, the Detroit Youth Choir came and performed during, during that venue, and they did it safely across the river uh, using technology, and it was almost like a silent disco, silent venue, but we could hear the, the choir. And so it, we, we had to get really, really creative uh, how to make people feel comfortable uh, in the midst of this pandemic and, and doing so and redesigning uh, not only the interior of many uh, edifices, but also rethinking and reimagining how we'd use some of the public spaces we have. Thanks, Mark. Emily, another theme from this year has been the way the health crisis has laid bare and often exacerbated existing inequities in our communities. How do the physical spaces we live in contribute to those inequities and contribute to poor health outcomes? Yeah, well, so if we take a step back for a minute and look at the world as it was before the pandemic, we already knew that the burden of bad environments falls mainly on the poor. Um, that has always been true. You can look at things like toxic mold or lead paint, um, those sorts of physically harmful environmental influences tend to be especially common in like low income housing and public housing in places where people are marginalized or low income or don't have a lot of political power. We can look at things like the Flint water crisis, which I think a lot of us believe would have played out differently if that had been in a wealthier community. So that was true regardless, but the pandemic has absolutely exacerbated these disparities and made it clear how unequal 
our environments are. So if you think about where some of the big super spreader events have been, um, a lot of them have been in prisons, they have been in nursing homes, they have been in meatpacking plants, in dorms for migrant workers. These are all places that tend to house people who are marginalized, who are vulnerable, who in some cases are undocumented and really can't push back against their employer or against the government. And so it's made these differences really stark. And we're seeing that people who don't have access to good environments are often falling sick. Mark. How are cities thinking about helping to alleviate some of the ways that physical infrastructure is contributing to public health issues and in, in inequities? Inequities, yeah, sure. Yeah, and I, I'd like to uh, just build upon what, what Emily shared earlier in terms of uh, communities that already had experienced um, some inequities prior to the pandemic and what the pandemic did was amplify. So a couple of couple examples. Number one, in terms of uh, uh, homes where uh, pretty older homes that had lead-based paint in it. Uh, we had one of the highest incidents of uh, lead-based paint uh, infections among children. And with the pandemic and the requirement for uh, more people to stay at home, to socially isolate, uh, to telework, or to even homeschool, you had more children that uh, had to spend more time in environments that were already uh, health risks because of the amount of lead-based paint that was in the homes. And so it, it, it caused us from a health and safety uh, perspective to do, even do more education, to educate the families around the hazards of lead-based homes while being challenged uh, to go into homes, inspect, to mitigate, uh, to remediate some of the, the, the issues. Um, because we really didn't know earlier on in the pandemic how safely it was. The, the, the amount of education and science had, had really not advanced to the point where we were really able to continue our abatement programs as normal. And so it, it, posed, a, it posed a significant challenge. And uh, we had to continue to partner with, with community members and family members to educate around those hazards, uh, those health inequity hazards. Another example is uh, what we've uh, been, many communities have been, uh, dealing with in terms of the unhoused population or the homeless population, those people who are already vulnerable uh, prior to the pandemic. And shelters, uh, in many instances, were either uh, almost full or, or crowded or even overcrowded. And in doing so, there were cots and mats and bedrolls in, in some instances where they're right next to each other. And so in order to keep them safe, uh, they had to uh, um, reimagine the ways that they would use their space and that required most uh, social distance and as a result capacity diminished and uh, and then you had another um, incident that forced some people to be without without shelter and 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 then began living within uh, the parks and, and and some of the other public spaces that we have while certainly not ideal uh, I think the CDC had given guidance that uh, in order to not further mitigate excuse me, further cause the spread of COVID, that disrupting outdoor camps, if there were not alternative housing and shelter, would just cause even more uh, health concerns. So we had to get creative even with that. And so uh, we had to look for opening even more shelter space, even though we would not have the same capacity that we had before, but looking at opportunities to uh, turn in unused uh, uh, vacant buildings and uh, vacant uh, facilities into more shelter space and even be creative in terms of uh, and sensitive in terms of how we were uh, managing the unhoused population when they were uh, have uh, when they were utilizing camps in uh, public spaces and parks and so that that is that that was quite a bit of challenge uh, that we are still working through quite frankly like many other communities but I think uh, what added complexity to us in Grand Rapids, where many communities in the South or even on the West Coast, uh, to have someone who chooses to be unhoused and live outdoors, uh, again, although not ideal housing circumstances, is bearable because they don't have the Midwest winters that we have here. So uh, compounded with the pandemic was also the harsh realities that we have with the uh, cold weather season here. And what we've seen in other communities is that uh, 
there, there are many people who, who unfortunately have um, had very complicated, uh, complicating health factors or even died uh, due to cold weather or have had uh, uh, fire hazards because of the, the, trying to keep themselves heated and warm in there. So that, that, is, that is cause ex extenuating complexities for us here in Grand Rapids. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Kofi, so, so Bedrock in many cases had to sort of rethink the landlord-tenant relationship this year. Give us some examples of that and tell us what that means for Bedrock and Detroit going forward. Well, uh, I will, let me, before I answer that specific, uh, specifically, let me just zoom out a little bit more because I do think that the comments made by Emily Marcus and Mark need to be uh, just enhanced and repeated be, uh, and maybe put it even in, a, in maybe even more uh, stark reality, for example, because what perhaps the saddest thing about the situation we're in now is we all knew this before the pandemic. We knew that the communities of color and the lower income communities were living uh, with very little digital access, poor access to health care, and we certainly knew they were living in conditions that weren't necessarily conducive to their best health, health outcomes. And uh, of course the pandemic has exacerbated all that and driven that to the fore. And I can tell you that it's, it, it's sad as somebody who has practiced with both from the public sector side and from the private side for so many years, it is, it is, uh, it is tragic that in many ways that we allowed the situation to get to this point. And, if you th and so you think back and you say, well, how did you get here? And I will say that it's a combination of, frankly, the just, a, you know, let's call it what it is, just the structural racism that exists in so many arenas within uh, our society. And then, you, but how does it translate into the built environment and how that occurs? And you look at zoning rules that require pla uh, certain places are built for lower income people and certain places are built for higher income people, if you will, and, you, and those, frankly, continue. You look at even uh, the, the, the way school, the school systems are distributed. You look at the way healthcare and health insurance issues. I mean, you can go on and on. And of course, with respect to real estate, you look at just the age old uh, institution of redlining, uh, which really has never um, been, been, been um, corrected. So if you think back before the pandemic, you can see that all the, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm sure, Emily, when you wrote the book, your book probably could have been written before the pandemic, I'm sure it was, and all these things that you pointed out uh, were true then and just exacerbated by the pandemic, and now everybody else can see it in stark reality. So, so, so that's, um, that's the sad news. The, 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 the good news as we look forward is now we know and more people have, as they say, awoken to this uh, issue. And, and, I, and I begin to think some of, the, uh, some of the solutions lie in exactly uh, looking at some of the problems that we had. First and foremost, I think the private sector and the public sector certainly needs to create bigger and better partnerships in dealing with some of the public infrastructure that exists in our larger urban communities. Uh, and some of those can't be dealt with primarily by the public sector, and some of those can't, be, frankly, be placed on the private sector. But I do believe the combination of private sector know-how with some resources from the private sector and public sector uh, regulatory authority and taxing authority perhaps can create very interesting opportunities to uh, improve the, the digital situation in some of these communities and certainly create much more, lower the carbon footprint in some of these communities and just become a much more uh, sustainable and, and livable, frankly, communities. Many urban planners and developers are thinking about 15 minute and 20 minute cities and neighborhoods where services are much more uh, accessible by biking or walking. And cities are beginning to think about the distribution of services. So the town hall, the city hall isn't just the place where you can get most things done, but perhaps you can distribute it through the network. Those are important concepts. Uh, certainly in, uh, with respect to real estate, uh, and specifically uh, bedrock, we're really beginning to think about sort of the next iteration of how we work within the cities of uh, Detroit and Cleveland. We're thinking through a broader, uh, uh, geographic uh, areas that perhaps 
looking not only where we are focusing our resources, but what the potential impact around those uh, anchor developments might be, and perhaps partnering with our cities uh, and counties and maybe even states and, and certainly, as Mark, uh, Mark has pointed out, the federal government, to see if we could improve those areas to, by bringing in criteria and actual resources associated with improving the digital uh, connections for a broader community, improving the sustainability of those areas by uh, ensuring that uh, um, folks who ultimately will live and work in those places have access to the kinds of uh, care and, and, and services that, frankly, they, they not only deserve, but, but uh, are available for the broader community. And those can be done through, I think, innovative public-private partnerships. And we're beginning to look in various districts within this city to see where we can implement that, especially in those areas where we are beginning to concentrate our resources. Marcus, Kofi just mentioned access to care. As a health system, you've had to totally rethink what that means this year. Tell us a little bit about what that's meant for Trinity and what it means for the future. Well, I, I think it, um, it, ex it really exposed some disparities and equities um, among our, our minorities and vulnerable populations. Um, the pandemic amplified social needs for communities. Um, and as we've um, responded to those needs, <clears throat> we deployed some, some things called social care hubs that are, are used to virtually or physically connect patients um, and colleagues to um, and community members to the local services such as food, housing, financial assistance, medication assistance, um, and access to medical care. So recognizing that the um, the the inequities that are in, are in our system um, have also been exacerbated by the systemic racism that exists within parts of our system. And and as as Kofi said, um, I think when you when you put these pieces together. Um, it really highlights the, the, the fact that the, the work that's been done um, is not enough. We, we have to continue to work, to work harder at this. And at Trinity, we're recognizing that um, systemic racism, along with the inequities that we've observed during COVID-19, um, is nothing short of a public health crisis. And so at Trinity Health, we've declared that racism is a public health crisis, and we're working to address some of the inequities that we found through COVID-19. Yeah, I'll, I'll add and, and, and certainly um, affirm what's been said about the uh, historical uh, systemic impact and of uh, racism and, and, and what we've learned through COVID as being um, those issues that, that have been amplified. But I think it, what COVID has also done, it, as much as it amplifies some of the systemic issue, it has created an urgency around accelerating solutions. So the digital divide existed before COVID, but I do believe that there has been more intentionality around closing it since. In a couple of examples, we've been forced to do so, at least uh, with helping to increase the accessibility of technology for schools to ensure that, that, that children can continue to, to learn. And that has resulted not only in, in the traditional way of ensuring that they have laptops or, or computers at school, but now we've done creative things around how do we integrate the experiences at home and make sure that the household, uh, not just the student, but the entire household uh, can benefit from uh, e enhanced technology. Or uh, in many communities, utilizing already assets uh, like school buses to make sure that there's Wi-Fi in, in school buses as they roam through uh, certain communities or what we did in Grand Rapids is take existing public spaces and green spaces like parks and now have begun piloting uh, having Wi-Fi uh, available in city parks. And so th those, are, those are accelerated solutions that we were, we were contemplating, we were strategizing for kind of midterm and we realized, well, the pandemic has kind of forced us to usher those um, um, uh, right away. Um, the, other, the other example I can, I can also think about is, is uh, around public transportation. Um, that, you know, prior to uh, the pandemic, we knew that there were issues around accessibility uh, to transit and mobility to make sure that people can get to the places where the jobs are and with COVID, uh, just like the, what we saw within some of the shelters, social distancing had to be employed on, on public transit, which 
created a even uh, less opportunity for there to be a greater capacity uh, to transport people and, and as well as uh, because of the labor issues, uh, buses were not only, uh, the capacity was not as great as it was before, but they weren't able to go all around in terms of routes and servicing as, as much as they had before. And so what it did, it, it, it helped us to accelerate other mobility uh, options for last mile and first mile, specifically around bikes and scooters, et cetera, uh, that, that uh, other uh, members of the community could use. And so I think the optimism is, um, you know, we, we, have, we have been um, forced to rapidly innovate out of crisis, and we have to find ways uh, to make sure these are not things for the moment, but they continue to provide momentum for us moving forward and we continue to build and iterate off of them. Thanks, Mark. Okay, Emily, let's talk big picture here. What do you see design and our built environment, both on a macro and micro scale, taking away from this year? In short, what have we learned? Yeah, well, so I think the interesting thing is we're still in the thick of the pandemic. And so it's a little soon to say whether we actually will learn any lessons from this. I think there are some lessons we should learn, um, but I also think that the temptation to return to the status quo is going to be really strong when this is all over. So I hope we learn some lessons. And I mean, the big sort of macro level takeaway is just how much the indoor environment matters. Um, that's always been true, but the pandemic makes it even more apparent and, and more stark. The one example I find myself thinking about a lot in regards to that is ventilation in schools and in our public schools. And it turns out that ventilation has been a problem in American public schools for decades. A lot of these schools are not well ventilated and don't have good airflow. And we have the research to tell us that that's not good for kids. It's not good for their health. It's not good for their learning. But there's never been much push to change that until now. Now, of course, with an infectious disease that is circulated through the air, there's a lot of pressure to upgrade these ventilation systems. And we're finally seeing momentum for that. So I think that's like a positive silver lining. Um, but it's also a little bit troubling that it was something that we didn't pay much attention to before. But I do think we have an opportunity right now to really think carefully about what it means to create a healthy indoor environment and to seize that opportunity and to make it happen. So that's what I hope we'll take away from this. Um, time will tell. Uh, so Kofi, what's, what's Bedrock thinking about the future? Uh, what does the future hold for commercial real estate? Well, certainly um, you have to think of the asset classes. We're, we're fortunate enough to be in the office segment, the retail segment, housing, and uh, also in the industrial. And just take each one of them separately. In the office environment, I, we clearly have to think about the fact that while uh, the, our office tenants will probably take about the same amount of space uh, because you're now giving more space to folks, uh, you also have to create an office environment that is welcoming and exciting for folks to come back to. Because people have the option now to work from home for the most part. So why would they leave their home to work in an office? Well, partly the answer is the office environment create, provides something that the home environment doesn't provide. And so we have to be thinking about those things. And part of it, of course, is the camaraderie and the, and the hopefully the strategic conversations and the creative collaborations that can occur best in person. And when they're in the office, there has to be, and we are putting all the the air filtration systems in, the, you know, the sanitizing uh, stations, and putting in the investments to ensure people feel comfortable within their office spaces. Um, and, and, and so there's uh, with respect to the office. With respect to retailers, we're working very hard with our retailers to, uh, to make sure that they are getting the opportunity, that we are creating the events and the, the, the liveliness outside uh, so that people will be drawn to those spaces and they will, frankly, feel safe and spend their time and their, and their money within the establishments that are our, our tenancies. And candidly, we've had to learn to uh, rework some of the way the economics work for our retailers. 
And certainly the retailers have also done a fantastic job. Our tenants have done a fantastic job in many ways adapting to this current situation. Many of them have, got a, have done a great robust job go going online and virtually and uh, have really created some very interesting online and virtual models which, have actually, which will continue, I'm sure, when things begin to return to some level of the next normal. Uh, with respect to the industrial space, it's fascinating because if you think about the industrial space, much of the growth as, as brick, as uh, um, stores began to lose customers, the e-commerce went up. And as e-commerce and e-tailing rose, so became the need for logistics and warehousing. And so that's been a big boon in the in the retailing in the sorry in the industrial space, and that's become quite interesting to think out. Not only where does one store the goods that people are ordering online in these large logistics and automated warehouses, but also the what's called the last mile. So that when people order something, they know that within a couple of days or so they can get those goods. So we're all beginning to think within the city confines of a city, how to deal with that last mile concept so that we don't have big trucks going all over the city all the time. And, and that's a fundamental uh, sort of a city planning aspect that developers and I think again cities have to work together on to ensure that we're creating a, a built environment that is a, a, an urban built environment that's actually much more friendly to the uh, um, to the to the to the people who are living and working in the area than to frankly the automobiles and the trucks that may have to service them from time to time then there's housing and housing is really perhaps the biggest uh, inequities that exist today i am now more convinced than ever that one of our primary goals as we think about developing housing is how to increase the wealth accumulation in those folks who might be either, frankly, homeowners or even maybe in tenants in some respect. Haven't quite figured it out, but as with, but we are all having to, I mean, Emily's right. We, we don't know the answers yet, but at least we should be forced to be thinking about how to make sure that we at least can be planning ahead for what might, what will be the next problem. There will be another crisis, but at least we can begin to create a built environment that pays attention to some of the things we've seen in the past, we've experienced now everybody's experienced over the last year and really can we uh, narrow the gap in social inequities both in health and, 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 and in housing and frankly in economic development so that as people are going, meeting the next crisis they all feel much more of one community reinforced by frankly their togetherness. Can, can I follow up on, on that? Um, I think one of the things that I think most cities have been in the mode of since uh, the pandemic and, and, and certainly since uh, some of the public demonstrations around uh, social justice or injustice and, and racial inequities uh, with the, since the death of, of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor have been uh, emergency management and emergency planning. And thinking about what, what do we do over the next few weeks, few months, et cetera. And I think now we have an opportunity as we begin uh, to learn more about um, how to accelerate solutions as well as uh, the needs that have been amplified since the pandemic is to move from emergency planning to master planning and strategic planning of communities. And we are poised in Grand Rapids um, you know, to begin launching our master plan over the next you know, 20, 30 years, how, knowing the lessons we know now, how do we see ourselves in neighborhoods and our built environment over the next 20 years, where there are cities right now that are operating on plans that were, were good plans, uh, but it never imagined uh, the kind of realities that we've experienced over the, over the past year. And so, I don't know if City Hall will ever become the City Hall it once was, because just as we have talked about earlier around the e-commerce and e-engagement, uh, there are more people that are engaging digitally uh, with local government uh, than ever before, and that would never uh, have the capacity to fit in our 
physical chambers, but uh, we have quadrupled and in, uh, increased the amount of, of awareness and engagement significantly. Uh, our, our future here uh, within the city, certainly we have to think about uh, the need to, to make sure that as we have uh, the, ne the need for more housing uh, in Grand Rapids, we have to double the density uh, in downtown based on uh, the lack of housing supply that we have, and not only the supply at market rate, but at affordability at all, all levels. But how do we ensure that throughout our community, the built-in environment, we have services that, that are accessible and walkable, uh, as, as uh, we talked earlier about the last mile? How do we make sure that every residential neighborhood has a park that's within a 10-minute walk of each other? And maximizing uh, uh, green spaces through, throughout our community. And one of the things that we have learned, if anything, is the importance of outdoor, uh, outdoor experiences. And again, uh, to be able to experience that, even in the Midwest, um, year around. Because we, we cannot just depend on uh, the convenience of uh, having uh, indoor venues uh, in light of what we learned through, through the pandemic. And so right now we're, we're talking about how do we um, um, create a, a, a public asset around um, more amphitheaters and walkable trails and, and more access to some of the natural things in our environment that uh, it would not uh, totally depend on the built environment, but we'd be able to take uh, advantage of some of the natural beauty that we have within our community. Similarly, Marcus, what does Trinity Health learn from this year? What, what are you all going to take away? Well, I think the, um, the, the, the built environment is, is um, changing how we think of space. So we're, we're thinking of space now, not just like I said earlier, as the utilitarian, um, but more emphasis on the, the safety, um, resilience, and emotional well-being of our patients and our, our caregivers. Um, so I, I think that'll, that'll be something that we'll carry forward. Um, we're also going to be bringing more care into the home through virtual care centers, remote patient monitoring, um, and other programs to um, allow people to get care um, from their own or their own space. And um, I think that is, is going to be permanently changed. When you, when you put these things together, um, it's going to uh, take less uh, care, more care will be delivered in the, in the non-traditional settings. And I think that's what consumers are going to want. So the last question for today, uh, the importance of working together across industries and field has become pretty apparent from this conversation. How can we get better at the kinds of collaborations that will help us work on the societal inequities we discussed and lead to better health outcomes for more people? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll start then. So I, I think Mark has alluded to earlier, the, the smart zone is a perfect example of, um, and, it, and it relates to how do you intentionally design uh, space that allows uh, the intersection of many different sectors of our community and our economy to come together and think about how do we improve uh, the quality of life for, for residents in our community and around the world. And so the fact that we have hospital systems, we have research institutions, educational institutions, nonprofits, um, we have um, you know, startup businesses that are all beginning to um, become neighbors in neighboring communities in, in, in the in this smart zone allows us to begin to learn from each other, kind of like we, we're doing today, but doing it in an intentional way that, that creates an ecosystem of um, innovation and, and people coming together in our community. And I think the more that we can create spaces for that to occur, not only within the offices, but for it to occur naturally outside of the offices and community allows that learning to even uh, become more natural uh, in, in the terms of the way that we interact from each other. Because as much as we're talking about um, you know, economically learning and, 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 and intentionally learning to improve society, there's a lot of social learning that has to occur among people interacting with people who, who are different from each other. And so, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll just say that one other comment about the design of, of, the, uh, of uh, the office. I think Emily said this earlier about uh, making sure that there are open spaces and buildings and how that has an impact, uh, psychosocial or emotional impact on people. You know, for a long time, the only place that we had um, 
you know, garages in, 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 in city government, the only place in city government where there are garages that you can take the, lift up the garage and it, it transfers from the indoor to the outdoor and it's have this integration as a fire station. Well, what we're seeing now is uh, in terms of designs, in terms of uh, restaurants and businesses, uh, where you have that convertible space where the indoor and the outdoor becomes one just by the lifting, not of opening of a window, opening of a door, but the, the lifting of the entire section of the wall with a garage. And we're starting to see that in, in, in designs and homes as well in terms of backyards. But I have that nowhere in uh, one of the public spaces in city government. I, I'm, I mean, th those are kind of some of the things that I think that we can learn from other places and vice versa as we move uh, our community forward. Marcus, what about you? Well, I think as we've explored it today, there, there are things that we can do to that align the, the health system with public and private stakeholders of our built environments and public spaces. And the, the conversation that we started, started today really is focused on how do we create the conditions that keep all people healthy. Um, and I really enjoyed the dialogue with my uh, co-panelists today and look forward to how this conversation can evolve and the uh, good work that's happening in Detroit and Grand Rapids, as well as in the Trinity Health Ministries across the country are, um, are, are very much aligned with uh, what Emily's um, book has, has uh, taught us all. And, and Kofi, what has is, what is Bedrock learned about collaborating this year? Sure, sure. Well, look, uh, by virtue of the fact that not only are we operating real estate assets with a variety of different tenants and clients and customers, we are forced uh, um, um, in an urban environment within municipalities. We are forced to be collaborative and coordinate with a variety of different entities, right? We have to coordinate with our tenants. We have to coordinate with the cities. And, and, and we are also currently in the process of building the Hudson's, which is going to be you know, one of the premier uh, spots in downtown Detroit and Cantley in Michigan, which is going to be a premier mixed-use office uh, development with a uh, five-star hotel and branded residences on top. We're currently uh, building an innovation uh, district. We're planning an innovation district, which will have a Detroit Center for Innovation, will be a center of excellence for a variety of different institutions with R&D, et cetera, which can also include uh, uh, potentially a, a medical uh, research aspect. Uh, and, and there are so many more things. We, uh, uh, the, Detroit has become the center of innovation for so many companies. The Detroit Metro is one of the most uh, uh, innovative areas within the country, believe it or not. There are as many patents coming out on the mobility and autonomous uh, 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 car front uh, uh, in Detroit Metro as there is in Silicon Valley. And there's a large amount of uh, industriousness, obviously, out of here. So. We as developers and be people who shape the urban environment are required to work with all of these entities to act and house their facilities. So we're forced to collaborate. And as we collaborate, we have to learn and from each of these potential customers and tenants. And what we do as we learn from them is we ask, what is it that suits your employee? Because everybody recognizes that the productivity depends on the health safety and frankly well-being i think emily put it of that employee and tenant and so we have to learn from our respective customers and design the best spaces and places for them and then we work in public private partnerships with cities municipalities the states etc to help craft those situations in those areas that are outside of our buildings but absolutely essential for the live work play space for those uh, of our customers which are essentially the citizens and workers of, of Detroit and Cleveland so what are we learning we are learning to ask the right questions to seek the right expertise like people from Emily who understand how people are thinking about this to learn from our own uh, 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 fabulous uh, uh, companies because we are uh, uh, our parent company, if you will, is Rocket Mortgage, which is the nation's largest uh, mortgage banker, and and we can learn a lot from the 20, 25,000 folks who are employed by uh, team members that are employed by Rocket Mortgage who are working uh, within many of our buildings. So 
we, we have to engage in many conversations as landlords to these tenants and potential tenants just to ensure that we are satisfying the needs of their team members and employees so that we can be the best landlord that we can be. Thanks, Kofi. Uh, and em Emily, why don't you wrap us up here? Uh, how, how do you think we can, we can better collaborate and better learn from each other? Yeah, I think that communication and collaboration is essential and it's essential sort of at the final stage of things when cities and neighborhoods and organizations are actually constructing and developing buildings, but it's also essential long before that. So I write a lot about scientific research and research into the built environment. And one reason we haven't paid more attention to some of these issues until now is because they're sort of inherently cross-disciplinary. They cross architecture and design and engineering and public health. And so those disciplines have traditionally been kind of siloed as a lot of academic disciplines are. And it's only in really working together that professionals and academics from those different fields have been able to sort of uncover some of these relationships between our environment and our well-being. And so that's been really critical in even getting the data in the first place and is going to continue to be really critical in terms of moving the science of these spaces forward and, and making sure we're understanding what's going on. Thanks, Emily. And thanks to all of you. Really enjoyed this conversation today. I uh, hope all of you listening did as well. Uh, if you want to find out more about what's happening with some of these people and their organizations uh, and or just the state of Michigan, uh, check out the Michigan House booth uh, on the South by Southwest platform. Thanks, everybody.